All right. Well, our theme for 2022 has been Begin Again. We uh, were together as a leadership team on Friday evening and reflecting a little bit on the last year. I, I liked what you shared, Dave. You know, the, this year when you were going door to door handing out flyers and stuff, it reminded you of something you used to do back in the beginning of your Christian life. It kind of brought the whole theme of Begin Again full full circle. I don't know. I would love to hear uh, next, no, no, not next Sunday. Next Sunday is Christmas. The following Sunday on January 1st, we are going to have a sharing time as part of the service. And I would love to hear your, your stories, your thoughts about um, what this year meant to you as far as begin again. But this Sunday is the, uh, the third in our 2022 Advent series. Advent you may remember it literally means the coming, celebrating the coming of Christ. Also, his second coming is also considered an advent. It's a time of building the anticipation for Christmas, which is the celebration of Christ's coming. We recently completed a series on the Gospel of John, so it was suggested to me, why not, why not do an advent series on the Gospel of John? I thought, well, that's a great idea. Just one problem. John doesn't actually talk about Jesus' birth, but he does talk about Jesus' coming. And our messages this week or this month are coming from themes that come out of that first chapter of John as he's talking about Jesus' coming. Now, John is more than just a historian. Uh, John is not just recounting and retelling stories, but John is like an artist. And he is picking and choosing certain themes that he is weaving into his message like brushstrokes. He doesn't want to just convey facts, but he wants you to feel the impact of these events. You know, it's not enough to know that God sent Jesus into the world. John wants us to know what is the essence of that life. And more than that, to receive that life, to have it impact us in a way that changes us. So I'm going to take us to the first five verses of John 1. We uh, focused already a little bit on verse 1, but we'll be focusing on the rest of these verses today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When we read that, do you feel the impact of Christ coming into the world? It's like life coming into a lifeless body made from clay. It's like light shining into darkness. The darkness doesn't stand a chance. That same impact that we have in the creation story, we have once again in the Advent story. Light is greater than darkness. In the same way that life is greater than death. Life is greater than mere physical existence. Along with John's imagery, I've also been weaving some of our traditional Christmas imagery into these messages. Remember, we started out talking about a bell. And remember the bell from uh, the Polar Express? The the children can hear it, but the adults can't hear it. It's It's a lot like what it's like to believe. Last week, we talked about Santa, who, by the way, was an actual person and a Christ follower who was known for his generosity and his gift-giving. 
But so much of our idea of Christmas spirit is put into that tradition. But you know, it really, it all goes back to Jesus, who is the reason for the season. So what about life? Today we're talking about receiving his life. What is the symbol of life? Well, the Christmas tree has been a symbol of life. And its roots go all the way back, no pun intended, its roots go all the way back to pre-Christian times. According to History.com, the history of the Christmas tree goes back to the symbolic use of evergreens in Egypt and Rome, and then continued with the German tradition of candlelight Christmas trees, which were brought to America in the 1800s. So long before the advent of Christianity, Plants and trees that remained green all year had a special meaning for people, especially in winter. So just as people decorate their homes during festive seasons with pine, spruce, and fir trees, ancient peoples hung evergreen boughs over their doors and windows, and in many countries it was believed that evergreens would keep away witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and even illness. Some Christians are quick to point out that the Christmas tree was a pagan symbol before it became a Christmas symbol, and that's true. But the truth is, is that many or even most of our Christian symbols began as pagan symbols. And then Christians, as they were trying to share the gospel, saw a meaning in those symbols that they could relate then to the gospel message And so they reinterpreted those symbols with a gospel meaning. And the Christmas tree is no exception to that. Evergreen trees were believed to be magical because they remained alive looking when all of the other trees and grass and flowers are dying. The winter solstice, which, by the way, is right around December 21st, the days are the shortest And the nights are the longest. Bringing a bough or a small tree inside the house was a reminder, so to speak, that life would eventually win over death. Things will come alive again. Just as light conquers darkness, life wins over death, and evil will one day be conquered by good. You know, it may be just a superstition for many people, but there is a real truthful message in it if you know where to find it. Let's take a little closer look at what John says about Jesus coming into the world and bringing life. If you're following along in your handout, which is in your bulletin or on the online bulletin, the fill in the blanks, here's the first point. All things were made through Jesus. That's right. That answer is Jesus. In the missions world, you know that Carrie and I, we love to travel and minister cross-culturally. In the missions world, we look for things in that culture that point to God's truth. You know, we don't just go into a culture and say, you guys are heathens, everything you believe is wrong. (laughs) You know, welcome to to your house. (laughs) No, actually, the truth is, is that God has sowed his truth into creation. And there are things in every culture that reflect his truth. You just have to find them and point them out. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says this. What can be known about God is plain to them the heathen, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they, even the Gentiles, are without excuse. That's what we call, in theology, we call general revelation. Everybody has access to some revelation about God just by virtue of the world that he's created. Nature tells us about God. 
Even pagans can know something about God just from nature, just by observing the essence of life. That's why the ancient Egyptians brought branches into their houses to celebrate the triumph of life over death each year by nature, symbolized by their god Ra, who would symbolically arise from the dead each year. Romans had a similar tradition, the Feast of Saturnalia, which came to remind them, and I mean, this wasn't just a feast, this was a raucous party. It reminded them that life would return in the spring and that abundance would come again. And some believe that the Emperor Constantine, who was the first one to institute Christianity as a religion, chose December 25th to celebrate Christ's birth because it coincided with the feast of Saturnalia and also with the winter solstice. The Celts and the Vikings are said to have worshipped the evergreen tree. They were also assigned to them of everlasting nature of life. These people and these cultures, well, till Constantine, they didn't know about Jesus. And they just started these traditions, but Christians saw that they contained some truth about life, which ultimately points to God, the creator. God created the world with seasons, a perpetual cycle of dying and rising again. At the same time, the world lives as if death is final, and that there's nothing after death, and that there's nothing worse than death. But it's already written into creation that life wins over death. It's written right there into the seasons. And Jesus showed us that this really is the truth about God and the divine nature when he died and rose again from the dead. He showed us not only that there's life after death, but he showed us what that looks like. Yes, pagans worshiped trees because they believed that they contained a living spirit or spirits that could drive away evil. But general revelation, just what you can observe in nature, teaches us that life is greater than death and that life is greater than evil. But only the Bible can tell us how God intervened to give us life and to rescue us from death and evil. That's the next fill in the blank. In Jesus is life. In Jesus is life. John 5, 25 and 26 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So from general revelation, one can know that life is greater than death, but what is the source of that life? And where does life come from? Well, it would stand to reason that life comes from the creator, right? But if life comes from a creator, that would make us indebted to our creator for our very life. Now that is the conclusion that mankind has tended, tended to avoid, right? We like it that life wins over death. We just don't want to be indebted to anyone for that life. Romans 1.25 says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. Worshiping trees instead of worshiping the giver of life. See how that works? The creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So it's so much easier to celebrate the idea of life 
than to realize our debt to the giver of life. It's easier to look at a tree and celebrate that not everything dies, but what dies comes back to life. But then you got to ask yourself this next question. Why is that? Why is that? Maybe you think that having a living tree is so much better than having a fake tree. Oh, in our house, we don't have one of those fake trees. We have a living tree. Well, that's great. You just killed it when you cut it down. (laughs) So much for that one. (laughs) You know, it brings us comfort and consolation to bring the outdoors in. You know, we're bringing the outdoors in. But do we ever ask ourselves, what is it that is so special out there that I would want to bring it in? We love living symbols, but sometimes we avoid the very meaning that those symbols point to. My life comes from God. Life comes from God. That's what the symbol means. Life comes from God. All life. I think it's cool that the The Christmas tree, it's it's actually like a big arrow that points upward, (laughs) showing us where the life comes from. But then we avoid the next part, and that is that I am now accountable to God for what I do with that life. Jesus is God. Jesus is God come into the world to the people that he created. That's what these verses from John are saying. Jesus is God come into the world to the very people that he created. And I said last week that a lot of people have this idea that Jesus is constantly judging them. You know, that's what they think of Jesus. We probably think that because other people represent God to us. Our parents, our teachers, our pastors. If they were critical and judgmental, that's what we think God is like. And yes, it's true. Jesus is going to judge the world. That much is true. But the whole point of his coming was to save us so that we don't need to fear judgment Remember this verse, John 3, 17? We talked about it last week. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So why don't we immediately associate Jesus with life? Why can't we see that the Christmas tree points upward to Jesus? And you know what? The cross is also a tree. Isn't that interesting? The symbol of death became the symbol of life. Jesus died on a tree so that we could have life. Jesus is life. He is the creator and the sustainer of life. He is the source of life. John 5.24, this time in the living Translation says, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who have sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. But they have already passed from death into life. Isn't that powerful? God At creation, you remember this, he breathed life into man, made whatever, little stick guy out of clay, breathed into him his own breath, and he became alive. It's God in us that gives us life. Jesus gave us The Holy Spirit, remember, he 
breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It goes back to creation, the wind, the breath, the ruach of God living inside of us. You know, I, I think it's interesting that not only do we celebrate trees as a symbol of life, but we bring them indoors, right? Actually, it didn't start out that way. Early celebrations of German-American immigrants, they would have a community tree that they would decorate. You didn't have individual Christmas trees. You had a community Christmas tree, and you would decorate that tree, and that would be your community Christmas tree. But over time, it became more prevalent to have a Christmas tree in your own home for your own family to enjoy, and they would gather around that. But, you know, I I think it's interesting that we have both community corporate Christmas trees and we have personal family Christmas trees because isn't that also the way we recognize the Holy Spirit as both personal and corporate? When Paul says that the Holy Spirit lives in you twice, it's corporate, you all, and once, it's individual, in you, personally. We have both a corporate and a personal life in the Holy Spirit as Christians and as a church. What should we do with Jesus, who is the embodiment of life? Well, first of all, we place him at the center of our community life and our experience. We have a corporate relationship with Jesus, but we also bring him into our homes, into our families, and make him the center of our daily life. And if you want to follow the symbolism, here's the part that I love. Take all your gifts and place them at the feet of Jesus. Just like we put our gifts under the tree. Think about that one. Here's another fill in the blank. Jesus lights up our life. Jesus lights up our life. Christmas trees aren't just ordinary trees, but you know, we we light them up, right? <laughs> We decorate them with color and shiny ornaments and especially nowadays since the advent of electricity with lights. It seems that John isn't the only one who likes mixing the metaphors of life and of light. Germany is credited with starting the Christmas tree tradition as we now know it in the 16th century when devout Christians brought decorated trees into their homes. And it's widely held belief that Martin Luther, the 16th century Protestant reformer, first added lighted candles to a tree. And this is the story. That walking towards his home one winter evening, composing a sermon, he was awed by the brilliance of stars twinkling amongst the evergreen trees. And to recapture the scene for his family, he erected a tree in the main room and wired to its branches lighted candles. So it was Martin Luther who added lights to the tree is reminiscent of the stars in the sky, a mixture of life and of light. And it reminds us that all of this life that we celebrate is happening against a backdrop of eternity you realize that life isn't just about your lifetime, but about, it's about God's plan for all of history and beyond. You know, the, the meaning of life is more than just our present prosperity and happiness. It's about God's plan to restore the world to himself. We're going to talk about light and darkness more again next week. But for now, I just want to point out that the comparison between light and life 
is really to show us the contrast. Light stands out against a backdrop of darkness. In fact, the darker it is, the more the light shines. Darkness can never win. That's what John's pointing out in verse 5. And the darkness cannot overcome it. It can never win. Because the darker it gets, the brighter the light will be. Life is like that too. Sometimes it seems like life is not all that special. I mean, we take it for granted. But when does life mean the most? When we're faced with death, illness, tragedy, it's against that backdrop that we realize just how precious life is. The light of life shines brighter against the darkness. Popular movie for the holidays is It's a Wonderful Life from 1946. Have you all watched this yet? Some people watch it every year. You guys do? <laughs> Every year, it's been acclaimed as one of the greatest films of all times with numerous awards. The main character, George Bailey, feels like his life is full of obstacles and nothing ever turns out quite the way he dreamed that it would. And then at one point, spoiler alert, he loses a large sum of money by mistake and he thinks that his life is over. But an angel shows up. And in that, it's just like the Dickens' A Christmas Carol, right? He realizes that his life has more meaning than he realizes it does. And that he has inadvertently done some good, even though all he can see is regrets. And suddenly everything looks different to him, right? (laughs) Against the backdrop of all of his failures... (laughs) Against the backdrop of thinking his life is over, suddenly life becomes precious. After seeing it from the perspective of what if he had never existed. You see, life is wonderful. For all of us, for each of us. Except that sometimes we can't see that until we have an alternative to consider. You know, the German Christmas tree wasn't just about life and prosperity. It actually embodied the story of Adam and Eve. It was sometimes called the paradise tree. And the earliest decorations on the Christmas tree were actually apples hung on the tree to represent the fruit of Eden. (laughs) Just don't go taking the wrong one, right? Later, they actually hung communion wafers on the tree as a symbol of redemption. And then the communion wafers eventually became cookies and candy and popcorn strings. Life on earth began with trees, right? It's part of the story. And it's going to end with trees, too. You trace that tree theme through the Bible goes from beginning to end. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street also. On either side of the river, there it is, the tree of life, same as was in the garden, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Hey, it's a wonderful life. And it's going to have a wonderful ending. (laughs) Because God is redeeming the life that he gave us. Here's the last fill in the blank. Jesus makes all the difference. Why did John say that life is like light and that light overcomes darkness? Well, 
First of all, because we don't really understand life until we know Jesus. And you could even say that knowing Jesus is a matter of life and death. But sometimes we don't really seem to believe that. Because we treat our spiritual life as if it's an optional thing, right? Maybe I'll go to church today if I feel like it, <laughs> right? Church means meeting with God, but it's, it's not that important. You know, you can just cancel it if it's inconvenient, right? Say amen or ouch. I don't have time for devotions today. I'm just so busy. You know, you can't afford to ignore your time with God. Where do you think life comes from? Where do you think your energy and focus comes from? If life comes from God, then why would you cut off your lifeline? John 6, 63 says, The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Did you notice something about the fill in the blanks this week? It does. Yeah. The answer to every question is Jesus. <laughs> I did that on purpose because I wanted to underline that he is the answer. You realize that without Jesus, life is just surviving. But with Jesus, life is an adventure. Without Jesus, life is just about me and my own happiness. How do I feel today? Am I happy? Am I not happy? Without, sorry, it was without Jesus. With Jesus, life is about, well, it's not about me. That's the point. With Jesus, life is about him. And where do I fit into his plan? With or without Jesus, life is hard and sometimes very disappointing. But with Jesus, even the hard times are things that God is using and working for our good. You see, it comes down to what you believe and understand about life. Are you living life for what you can get out of it? Or are you following that life back to its source and living the life that you were created to live? Just one more verse, John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it's he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, it's, it's your connection to Jesus that makes you alive. He is life. And without him, you are not really living. He is the tree of life, in the beginning of the Bible and in the end of the Bible. And we are the branches on that tree. Here's some questions for reflection this week. First of all, is your view of Christmas, is it pagan or is it Christian? I don't know. That's a pretty abstract question. How do I decide? Well, do you just worship symbols? Or do you see the meaning behind those symbols? <clears throat> Let me get more specific. Is Christmas just about trees and lights? Or is it about life and light? 
Number two, how do you feel about your life? Is life a constant struggle? (laughs) It is for most of us. Or is it a source of gratitude and wonder? To see in your life in the light of Jesus make a difference. Number three, what is life really about? I hope you ask yourself that question often and reflect on it. Are you living for something much greater than just your own happiness or existence? And then I'm going to mess with you a little bit. Do your current priorities reflect your answer to this question? Let's stand and sing as we respond to these things. <laughs>